Welcome to Installation 00 and this, the most detailed video series. In these videos I analyse technology from the Halo universe to a level of detail not found anywhere else in the galaxy. In this most detailed breakdown, we will analyse Mjolnir Mark V armour, the predecessor to the Mark VI armour of which we have already analysed. If you want to see that, we will link it in the description and here in the video. The Mark V, during its service, was the most sophisticated example of wartime technology ever constructed by humanity, and had some technological advancements implemented that many believe would never be possible. These advancements set the Mark V apart from its direct and spiritual predecessors, in that it enabled the platform to outperform all other examples of powered exoskeleton armor systems that had thus far been created. Project Mjolnir was, and still is, developed in tandem with the Spartan program. The Mark IV, V, VI, VII and most of their constituent variants were conceived and developed by Dr. Catherine Halsey and the Special Warfare Center in Seongnam in the nation of Korea, with some variants being developed by separate military and corporate entities, which we'll identify as and when we analyze them. These outsourced armor components and platforms were specially designed for more specific Spartan operations and thus deserve their own analysis. The Spartan class which would come to use it at the time were the product called Spartan II's, who, in and of themselves, are marvels of military, scientific, technological and biological innovations. We will also look at this at a later date. Emphasis was put onto the prototype innovation and development implementation for future iterations of the suit, in that the project was never deemed as completed. As technology was researched and developed, it was implemented in the current generation of the suit, then battle tested and iterated upon with upgrades, redundancies and new innovations to keep the suit at the bleeding edge of science and technology. This ethos when developing the technology has resulted in not only Mjolnir being the most powerful battle armor system ever used, but also led to innovations in technology and sciences that have permitted every possible avenue of society, setting it as one of the most influential and innovative projects ever undertaken by humanity. It is because of this that we're putting extensive effort into delivering the most detailed breakdowns of the program's various suit classes and mark systems to more fully appreciate the effort that has gone into their development. As with the Mark VI analysis, we will work from the outermost components inwards, analysing every layer and component as we go. As with the entire Mjolnir range, its most recognisable feature is the muscular olive drab armour plating, but the Mark V implemented a technological innovation that was absolutely unprecedented, and caused an innovations cascade which continued from its inclusion with the Mark V platform all the way through the end of the Human Covenant War, and is still happening today. This component is the backward engineered full body energy shield system. From their first operations against Covenant forces, Spartan II super soldiers were instructed to recover any technology of alien origin and return it to the UNSC for research and backward engineering attempts. The aim was to close the technological gap between the UNSC and the technologically superior Covenant. It was because of this foresight that the Mark V platform, and every platform since, has had full body energy shields. Spartans recovered Kigyar point defense gauntlets from fallen adversaries. These shields were of remarkable strength able to take huge amounts of firepower without failing. This made well-positioned and trained Kigyar a particularly difficult problem for UNSC forces. Once examples of these shield generator gauntlets were received by the scientists of the UNSC, work began on backward engineering them to unlock of shielding technology for the UNSC. After years of fruitless research, and many proclaiming that humanity would never crack Covenant technology, an in-depth assessment of the microstructure of the primary shield generator device and resonant amplifier revealed the complex quantum method of shaping a variable repulsive electromagnetic field into an envelope shape without short-circuiting the field or emit a polarity. This then enabled a high-energy plasma to be injected and held within the field, adding what can be considered as density to the shield and a self-resonant energy field strength increase you'd be forgiven for not fully understanding this process. 
Once the functioning elements of the energy shield was understood, work suddenly leapt forward to implementing a more sophisticated energy shield system. Refinement in the somewhat ineffective quantum electromagnetic flux manipulation field led to a much finer control over the high energy plasma medium. The electromagnetic envelope that was created was much more energy efficient and while it lacked a complex internal field geometry, its external geometry could be formed to exquisite resolution and detail, tapered down to less than a hair's width in the case of the bottom of the boots or palms of the hands, or scaled proportionally in field strength and density to create an energy shield layer several inches in thickness as with the chest and back. This innovation was quickly implemented into all Mark V platforms as standard. The energy shield emitters positioned across various points on the armour emit both the electromagnetic field and the high energy plasma medium and are positioned at geometrically significant locations across the surface of the armour to facilitate full shield coverage without unnecessary overlaps which could cause short circuiting. Early systems were rated at 8.9 megajoules or 2.5 kilowatt hours at first implementation but were rapidly upgraded to 15 megajoules or 4.2 kilowatt hours. As a consequence, the energy shielding of the Mark V was remarkably more efficient than the energy shields used by the Sangeli Warriors. The shielding, once activated, would induce an area of ionization around the suit, causing sensations of static electricity in both the wearer and the air around the suit. Once the field energy grew high enough to arc through the air, form into the desired shape and meet the fields of other emitters to complete the circuit, an audible pop would be heard as the air would jump away from the suit, as the high energy plasma medium was fed into the electromagnetic envelope. Initially glowing a bright golden shimmer as the particle fields were excited by the flow of electrons, then fading to invisibility. As the shielding takes fire, the shielding would flare as the field is once again excited by the influx of kinetic energy, causing field distortion, leading the shields to weaken. As this effect grows with each kinetic or energetic impact, it pushes the shield's outer EM field geometry back towards the inner one. Once these two fields got close enough, the fields short circuit one another and the shielding fails. At this point, a Spartan must gain cover to await recharge, or risk taking direct damage to the suit. Energy is drawn directly from the suit's power source and the shield recharges shortly after the shield stopped taking damage. The shielding enabled the Mark V a distinct advantage over previous platforms in that the shielding would cancel out the energy of incoming projectile or energy based weapons up to the emitter's field strength of 15 megajoules. This means that any incoming fire taken below this threshold was simply absorbed by the shields, sparing the armor plates completely. Any projectiles that exceeded this energy rating would instantly collapse the shielding cancelling out the full 15 megajoule of the energy of the fire being taken, but then leaving whatever energy remains to be transmitted directly to the suit's armour plating. The energy shields worked particularly well against Covenant energy-based plasma weapons by distributing the heat and energy of the plasma over a much larger surface area, minimising on the heating of the armour plating which could compromise the suit's pressure seals, armour plating or more sensitive underlying components, or even wound or kill the wearer. The large muscular plating of the Mark V covers the chest, arms, hip, legs, calf, feet and hands and is made of a highly resilient titanium alloy. The main armour plating is fastened to the underlying substructure via custom tooled tamper proof bolts that can only be removed by specialist tools. The Mark V also implemented another new innovation unseen in previous platforms. The sudden emergence of the alien threat of the Covenant and their more advanced energy based plasma weapons necessitated the need of a way to disperse the intense heat that is characteristic of these kinds of projectiles in a more efficient manner. A crystalline metallic composite refractive coating was applied to the upper surface of the armour plating. Due to the optical and thermal mechanical properties of this material, the plasma from Covenant weapons is distributed over a much larger surface area, leading to the heat being dissipated much faster and thus minimising on localised heating of the armour plates. Documented incidents with plasma weapons against the previous Mark IV armour without this refractive coating and the innovative energy shields resulted in an almost instant breach of the armour due to the intense heat damage from the projectiles which severely affected the Mark IV's operational effectiveness and usually mortally wounded the wearer. These incidents powerfully demonstrated the need for innovation. Some have argued the armour's properties and characteristics are that of a typical grade 5 titanium but this is not accurate. 
The primary titanium the UNSC uses is mined from planet Reach. It is known that this particular permutation of titanium is titanium-50, meaning it is a stable isotope of titanium with 22 protons and 28 neutrons, totaling 50 subatomic particles. This isotope of titanium is then alloyed with 4% aluminium, 2.5% vanadium and 1.5% iron, otherwise known as grade 38. The iron reduces the amount of vanadium needed as a beta stabiliser. Its mechanical properties are very similar to that of grade 5, but has good cold workability. The entire alloy is then molecularly strengthened to attain a condition known as single crystal superalloy. In most alloys, the microcrystalline structure tends to be arranged as islands of ordered atomic matrices all meshed together into a disordered phase matrix. This results in a grain boundary between the different orientations of ordered metal crystals within the alloy, and these boundaries result in areas of weakness in the material that high heat and stress can exploit and result in critical degradation of the plate structural integrity. A single crystal superalloy has all of the atomic structures of the material in an ordered phase and orientation, equating to a single crystal throughout the entire material. This means there are no grain boundaries and no weaknesses to be exploited. The plating is completely impenetrable to small arms fire and can take several glancing blows from armour piercing rounds without failing. Some of the plating over the extremities are solid plates, while the ones covering critical areas of the body are hollow plates, composed of equally thick inner and outer plates with up to a dozen leaves of titanium sandwiched between them. This is much more effective at stopping high velocity and armour piercing rounds than a solid plate of equal thickness, as a round that does penetrate the outermost layer would lose a great deal of its kinetic force in the initial penetration. The subsequent leaves would continue to slow the projectile to a standstill and if the round still managed to penetrate, the innermost surface is angled to redirect the kinetic force on a tangent to its entry vector, minimising overpenetration and redirecting the round away from the wearer. This plate design not only increases the armour's protective capabilities but also reduces weight. The coloration of the plates can be customised but the standard issue comes in an olive drab green with some of the plates around the joints being matte black to blend with a titanium nanocomposite bodysuit. The plating of the armour is designed to be structurally limited in its motion. This means that the plates near joints are designed to hit each other to prevent the risk of hyperextension of the joints, which could result in serious injury. Some of the plates are implanted with various additional systems, such as energy shield emitters obvious by the small visible light they produce, and magnetic weapon and ammo holsters, as well as an array of sensors for additional situational awareness and systems input, including, but not limited to, absolute pressure sensors, temperature sensors, air quality sensors, motion detector featuring a quantum mirror for ultra-fine tracking resolution, ultra-clear audio microphone array and auxiliary loudspeaker systems for close proximity conversation, air intake and exhaust ports, electronic compass, altimeter, accelerometer and a built-in torch. The component parts of the armour plating are assembled from up to a dozen smaller constituent armour components, all locked together into a larger component piece. They are generally manufactured to be the same size parameters as the Mark V made adjustments for the varying size of the wearer by a more extensive hydrostatic gel layer. That being said, the average height of a Spartan II super soldier doesn't vary much, often no more than a few inches, which can be easily adjusted for using the gel layer, and micro adjustments to the clearances between the plates and the underlying substructure. The Mark VI made the innovation of being more tailored to the physical dimensions of the wearer, but with its limits. The most prominent component contained within the backpack unit of the Mark V is the power supply control unit responsible for distribution of power across the suit based on where it is needed at any given time, and the more impressive mini nuclear fusion reactor. Atoms of deuterium, isotopes of hydrogen, are fused together under extremely high pressures via very powerful electromagnetic fields. The result is a helium-3 nucleus and the release of huge amounts of energy in the form of highly charged particles. These particles are converted into usable electricity via a process called electrostatic direct energy conversion. The fusion reaction occurs within a small reactor chamber within a highly charged plasma medium. A selective leakage port on the reactor chamber opens, and by means of magnetics and electrostatics, the ions and electrons in the plasma medium selectively leak from the reactor chamber and are directed into an expansion chamber. 
Here, the plasma medium containing the highly charged particles is guided and expanded in volume by a fan-shaped magnetic field that reduces the power and density and converts the rotational energy of the reactor chamber into directional energy, suitable for energy conversion. The electrons are separated from the plasma stream and collected on a 22-stage electron collector grid of varying potentials, based on the variance in high and low energy electrons. This forms the negative term of the power source of the direct energy converter. Next, the ions are decelerated by retarding electrons electric fields, kinetic energy is thereby converted to potential energy. And finally, the decelerated ions are collected on high voltage electrodes that form the positive terminal of the power source. This method of converting raw nuclear fusion energy to usable electricity can be considered as a particle accelerator in reverse. The high energy particles in the chamber are decelerated to low enough speeds to be effectively and above all efficiently manipulated and converted. This highly compact and linear system plays well to the tight space requirements of the Mark V platform and indeed, various Mjolnir generations to come. The entire fusion reactor occupies a volume of 48 inches cubed, or a package size of only 12 inches by 2 inches by 2 inches, half the size of the standard fusion packs carried by Marines, yet able to produce continuous power for 15 years of usage before maintenance and replacement are needed. The reactors are encased in a specially hardened casing so as to be protected as possible from breach or damage. Each unit is completely sealed, electromagnetically shielded and radiation proof. As a failsafe there is a system that can be implemented to self-destruct the suit to keep the technological advancements it contains from enemy hands. A serial code is input and a system overcharges the fusion pack. The result is the incineration of anything within 10 meters, followed by a detonation that completely destroys the suit, its occupant, and anything nearby, guaranteeing that nothing is left for the enemies to use or salvage. Next we come to the matte black titanium nanocomposite bodysuit. This component is made of a nanoscale titanium alloy composite. While the other alloyed materials are strictly classified, it is reasonable to assume that carbon plays a significant role, as the suit is particularly good at dissipating energy from directed energy weapons. It is highly flexible, but very strong, adding additional protection from ballistic and energy-based projectiles. The suit also incorporates some thinner matte black titanium plating at the inner thighs, abdomen, elbows, knees, and various other locations of biological articulation facilitating continued freedom of movement but simultaneously giving protection to these vulnerable locations. The gloves feature sensors that detect the weapon being held and displays the relevant information about the weapon to the suit's situational awareness systems. It's a simplistic system as most UNSC issued weapons and indeed civilian issued weapons have electronic components to display ammunition capacity, so the suit simply detects this information directly from the weapon's internal electronics. For Covenant weaponry, the suit effectively detects the physical profile, weight, among other things, and compares them against a database of known weaponry, and once a match is found, the suit displays the information. For unknown weapon systems, the suit usually doesn't display any information at all. The titanium in this layer acts highly efficiently as a Faraday cage, making the inner layers of the suit completely impenetrable to electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic pulses. The bodysuit also has numerous structural hardpoints located across its surface. These are designed to be the main connection interface between the heavy outer plating and the softer, more flexible bodysuit. The plates are bolted onto these via custom tool tamper-proof bolts and some by tongue and groove connections. These structural hardpoints redirect the weight of the armour plates through the internal titanium substructure, meaning the wearer doesn't feel the weight of the suit. A very wise decision given that the total weight of the suit is a thousand pounds or half a metric tonne. The titanium nanocomposite bodysuit is the last visible outer layer of Mjolnir, as all the following components are protected under the soft armour of this suit and the hard armour plates. At the innermost surface of this suit is the pressure seal. This component is a resistive composite that is entirely airtight and waterproof. It's treated with a coating of nanoparticulate synthetic copolymer specifically designed to be super hydrophobic, vacuum proof, radiation proof to alpha, beta waves, and resistant to gamma waves. This component allows a pressurized and breathable atmosphere to be maintained at all times, down to a zero ambient pressure and up to extreme ambient pressure. The pressure seal is very powerful and from incidents involving overpressurizing of the hydrostatic gel layer and low orbital insertions, we can calculate the seals have an estimated breach strength of around 12,000 psi of internal pressure. 
The suit also houses a large quantity of internal computational systems including the Mark V BIOS, which is the firmware written to initially boot up the suit's systems, identifying, testing and initializing them as needed, and updates to the BIOS allow new hardware to be supported. This is the last outwardly visible layer of Mark V. It is worth noting at this point that with the exception of some optimizations to the reactive metal liquid crystal layer, and the complete absence of the auto repair and bypass nodes and the thrusters built into the back unit, the remaining components are majoritively the same as the Mark VI breakdown we have already covered. If you have seen that video, then feel free to navigate to this timestamp to skip to the helmet breakdown. If not, please stay where you are, and I will now go over these components in detail. We are now through the armoured sections of the suit, so we can get a closer look at some of the more interesting components of Mjolnir. Many of these components occupy a common area or layer of the suit as a whole, so we will address each component as we come across them. The next components go hand in hand. The first being the force multiplying circuits, a series of systems found in locations of movement throughout the armour. They basically increase the power and speed of voluntary movements by the user, making hand-to-hand -hand combat with stronger or faster adversaries much easier, especially when engaging with Sangeli or Jurulhane, both being physically superior to humans. The circuits are difficult to adjust to, as small motions can be translated to large dangerous ones if not conducted correctly. It is for this reason that only individuals with carbide ceramic ossification augmentations can use the armour, as normal bones simply aren't strong enough to withstand the force and speed these circuits create. The other system is the reactive metal liquid crystal layer. This layer is composed of a polymerized lithium niobacene, a material originally used to diffuse the static electrical build-up in ship's hulls during faster than light slip space travel. It is a piezoelectric material, meaning when it is mechanically deformed, it creates an electrical charge, a reaction which also works in reverse. When an electrical charge is applied to it, it mechanically deforms in shape. The material is amorphous, meaning it doesn't appear to have a crystalline structure, and thus flows like a liquid. However, upon electroactivation, a crystalline structure is induced, giving it the properties of a solid. It is poured through a microcapillary system throughout the suit, where high accuracy and strength microelectrical fields can induce the crystallization geometry process and cause the deformation along the desired axis. So when the user sends the neurological signal for voluntary movement to their skeletal muscles, the suit interprets this signal and sends the relevant electrical signal to the capillary system surrounding the desired muscle groups. The material mechanically deforms and creates movement. It practically scales and amplifies the user's strength and features an optimization of the crystalline geometries not available to previous Mjolnir versions, giving the user around five times their unarmored strength and increases reaction time by a factor of five. It is noteworthy to mention that the system cannot be scaled back or limited in any way, so only Spartans with their augmented physiology are able to harness the power of this system. The next layer is the Memory Processing Superconductor layer, a crystalline material developed to allow AI constructs the processing power to be fully facilitated. This layer allows an AI usually only able to be stored and functional in UNSC ships or facilities to piggyback Mjolnir's systems and travel with the Spartan, assisting in espionage, intelligence operations, tracking, software intrusion and hacking, as well as listening in on enemy communications. This layer is harnessed by the AI via the Spartan Neural Interface. The AI in question occupies the connection between the suit and the brain, allowing it to process information in both the suit and the brain, and in some cases, the AI can optimize the connection between the user and the suit, resulting in very brief periods of immensely increased cognitive and physical capabilities. The most well-known instance of this relationship is that of Master Chief Petty Officer John 117 and UNSC AI Cortana where the symbiotic connection between the two have become legendary across humanity, adding to the Chief's already impressive military and physical accomplishments. Since we're on the subject, the Spartan Neural Interface is an upgrade of the neural interface all UNSC personnel are given at enlistment. 
It is a filament of semiconductors that interfaces to the cerebral cortex of the host in a similar fashion to electrocorticography implants, but has some key differences. While electrocorticography is achieved by placing sensors on the surface of the brain to monitor brain activity, the Spartan neural interface is implanted within the brain tissue to both passively monitor and actively interface with the cerebral cortex. It is implanted via a complex surgical procedure and once implanted the interface accesses the basic IFF friend or foe tags that come as standard, facilitates dual processing of an AI between Yoni's embedded memory processing superconductor layer and the host's brain, and directly links the brain to Yoni's systems, allowing thought to be translated into motion seamlessly via the reactive circuits. The circuits in question increase the reaction time of the user by effectively bypassing the body. Nerves, while extremely good at transmitting chemical messages, still have physical limitations. Due to the natural resistance present in all materials, even electrically conductive ones, it means that the signals have a limit to how fast they can travel from brain to muscle. The average nerve conduction velocity for humans is around 40 to 45 meters per second. Plus, brain and muscle processing time means thought to motion happens in as little as 15 milliseconds. In Spartans, after their augmentations, estimated nerve conduction velocity increases to 120 to 145 meters per second, meaning thought to motion is approximately 5 milliseconds, a 300% increase in reaction time. The reactive circuits take the impulse created by the brain from within the brain convert it to a digital signal and send it to the suit's movement systems, since digital signals travel through the suit's circuits at 280 million meters per second. Thought to motion happens so fast it is nearly impossible to chart. Since the systems translate thought to motion faster than the host's nerve conduction velocity, the wearer has to take a long time to get used to the effect as the user voluntarily sends the signal to move the suit, but the suit moves the user before the user's signals have taken effect. This reaction is so fast that only Spartans with their altered neural physics and enhanced physiology are able to handle such an increase. The next layer we come across is the hydrostatic gel layer. The hydrostatic gel is a hydrogelatin, or water-based gel. It is blue in colour and serves the purpose of regulating temperature as well as conforming to the wearer's body for a better fit within Mjolnir. It can also be pressurised to protect the wearer from high g-forces, large impacts and zero ambient pressure. The gel automatically adjusts its pressure based on what sensor arrays tell the suit, but can also be manually overridden and overpressured to protect the wearer, although it runs a risk of reducing a nitrogen embolism. In the event that the suit takes on excessive heat, for example for sustained or high energy plasma fire, Mjolnir has an exhaust port built into the suit that releases the gel, preventing the occupant from being burned or boiled alive. Sustained damage to the suit can cause this gel layer to become viscous, rendering either partially or completely ineffective. The hydrostatic gel layer also features an armor lock system, where the gel's density is altered to completely seize up the entire system into a rigid posture. Doing so prevents muscle and joint injury from high impact, rendering the suit and the wearer completely stationary. Embedded into this layer are various automatic biofoam injectors. Biofoam is an elastoprotein wound filler. It is an expandable, sterile spray with a local anaesthetic, clotting agent, antibacterial, antiviral and antifungal properties. If the wearer becomes injured, the biofoam injectors activate and fill the wound with biofoam, sealing the wound, stemming the bleeding, and giving some pain relief. The biofoam doesn't heal the user as such, and these serious injuries will still require medical attention. These features allow a Spartan to remain operationally effective for much longer than your average soldier. The inner skin suit is a skin-tight compression layer, covering all of the body including feet, toes, hands, fingers and head up to the face line. It is a moisture wicking layer designed to draw sweat away from the body and is also filled with temperature sensors that link to the hydrostatic gel layer for temperature regulation. It also features wireless direct bone conduction earphones to allow the communication gear inside the helmet to link directly to the earphones. The suit also features water recycling systems for urine purification enabling the user to function for longer periods of time in environments with low water supply.
Made from the same titanium as the armor plating, the helmet contains a full heads-up display built into the gold reflective polarized visor. The visor in question is made of an extremely resilient, specially tempered composite cell multi-laminated sapphire glass. This makes the glass extremely hard, very resistant to scratches and shattering. Small hexagonal cells of the sapphire glass are grown and tempered, then layered with a strong ultra-transparent laminate polymer. These small hexagonal cells are then bonded together using a liquid annealing process, which simultaneously bonds the hexagonal cells together, releases internal stresses within the crystalline structure of the sapphire glass, and toughens the final component. This is then treated with a polarization on the outer surface, which renders the visor its characteristic gold mirrored finish, and a coherent light molecular display on the inner surface, enabling the heads-up display functionality. The heads-up display is capable of displaying mission-critical and situational awareness data. A visual display from the motion sensors is visible with a yellow blip showing as friendly units, white as neutral units, and red as foes. The systems inside also detect the weapon being held and display a targeting reticle matched to the angle and trajectory of the barrel, and thus the rounds to be fired. It gives a visual image of the weapon being held and its current ammunition capacity, all being fed from the weapon in question or calculated by the system itself. The shield recharge bar is clearly visible and the system detects incoming fire trajectory by checking which shield emitters are taking the incoming fire and displaying a red directional haze around the targeting reticle to give the user visual guide to incoming fire. The visor comes with built-in zoom function, effectively magnifying the light coming through the visor and redisplaying it in a zoomed aspect ratio. It also has a smart scope system, able to link wirelessly with weapons with scopes, and display the scope view as a full face display, particularly good for long range shooting accuracy. The system also detects any holstered weapons or grenades and can display waypoints, objectives and place markers above friendly units' heads and target units, and a visual compass is also visible by default. Many additional pieces of information can be displayed ad hoc based on the needs of the time. The Spartan can access the systems menu where various diagnostic tools, features and rosters can be accessed. The helmet has an ultra clear microphone array and speaker array built into the helmet to allow the user to hear outside of the suit sealed systems, as well as communicate both out loud and over radio communications. The helmet also makes the physical connection between the Spartan neural interface and the suit, enabling the full speed and power of the suit to be harnessed, although, even when the helmet is removed, the user can still move and function, but at greatly reduced speed and efficiency. The link between the neural interface and the suit really comes into its own in regards to the helmet, as all of the internal functions of the helmet systems are accessible and usable via the neural interface. The user simply thinks about what they want to do, and the system recognizes it and adjusts accordingly. No need for a secondary interface. To control the helmet systems, just think of it, and the system does it. The helmet also contains an air infiltration system. The air intake is on the left side of the helmet just below the jawline. The air is pulled in and filtered through a high efficiency particulate arrestant or HEPA class 20 filter, a high efficiency gas absorption or HEGA filter and an ultra low penetration air filter or ULPA, altogether capable of filtering 100% of particulates, toxins, pathogens and molecules from the air. The air is pumped into the helmet just left of the mouth and exhaled air is sucked out of the exhaust vent just right of the mouth passing through yet more filters to the external exhaust vent. In the event that the suit enters a vacuum or underwater, the external vents can be sealed and a rebreather unit activates for up to 45 minutes of breathable air. The helmet also houses a torch and mission camera as well as connection hardpoints for various additional systems to be directly connected to the helmet. The helmet also makes the final connection seal in the pressure suit and is fully supported by the suit so the user doesn't feel the weight of the helmet. And with the helmet in place, this legendary platform of Mjolnir armor stands at 7 feet tall and over a thousand pounds, or half a metric ton, and in its time, was the most powerful and devastating piece of technology in existence. The Mark V implemented a plethora of technological innovations and enhancements that did not exist at the time of the Mark IV's release, and that have been the foundation to all further developments achieved ever since. It played a pivotal role in the Human Covenant War, and is the second most recognisable version of Mjolnir after the Mark VI suit that John 117 wears. This video has been the most detailed breakdown of Mjolnir Mark V and is intended as a start point for future exploration. 
All the peripheral variants and permutations of armor components that were released as part of the Mark V platform, including but not limited to Mjolnir Mark V, AA, CQB, CQC, Commando, EOD, EVA, Gungnir, Hazop, JFO, Mark V-B, MP, OP, Pilot, Scout, Recon and Security will be investigated in their own most detailed videos. Thanks for sticking with me. If you have any suggestions on anything within the Halo universe that you would like to see given the most detailed treatment, stick them in the comments down below and I'll get to them as soon as I can. As I'm sure you understand, the level of detail that I insist on getting down to is of an intensity that it can take quite a while to fully flesh out the more complicated constructs. That being said, it's something I enjoy and I hope you have too. If you want to see more stuff like this, pop over to Installation 00. Link is in the description and on screen. That is to be the new home of all future most detailed breakdown videos. So I'd be grateful if you pop over there, subscribe, and if you've made it to the end of this video, you've evidently pretty fanatical about the Halo universe, in which case, click the little bell icon over there. That way, next time I put a video out, you'll be notified the second it hits the shelves, so to speak. Take care, guys, and I'll see you over there.